tēnā koutou katoa. Is that going? Okay. Um, ko tēnā i te mahi atu ki a koutou. Uh, ko tāi mai nei ki te uh, whakarongo ki ko tātou um, rangatira, uh, jo ba Joanne Baxter, Associate Professor Joanne Baxter. Um, ko au ko Bridget Robson a hau, um, te Associate Dean Māori mō tēnei kura. Um, and so, kei te mahi ki a koutou. Ki a koe hoki e hoa, um, ko hoki mai ki, um, ki tēnei whare. Um, uh, ka, ka nui te mahi ki a koutou, ko tō tīma, uh, me, me ai mahi uh, whakahirahira. Um, it's my pleasure to, and, and we'll, to welcome you to this talk by Associate Professor Joe Baxter. Um, I'm the Associate Dean Māori for this school. Worked closely with Joe over many years. Uh, Joe was just telling me before we came in that the last time she spoke in this um, theatre was when she was working for Te Whare Māori. So Joe was a psychiatrist, uh, a Māori psychiatrist at that time. Um, she's had multiple journeys in her career as a public health physician uh, and um, she's done some fantastic outstanding work um, with uh, the Māori Health Workforce Development Unit in Dunedin and uh, supported by some of the people in this room uh, from the Ministry of Health. Um, and I'm not going to speak too long, Joe, because I want you to have as much time as possible. Um, welcome to the people who are, who are watching online. Um, and you, we're going to, Joe's going to speak for about half an hour and then take questions um, from the audience and from those who are online. Right, um, kia ora, Joe. O kia ora tātou, e ngā mana, e ngā waka, e ngā reo, e ngā karangatanga o te motu, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, kia ora nō tātou katoa. A ko ai au, ko tūtoko te mauka, ko makawhi o te awa, ko kaitahu ka te māmoi me waitaha oku iwi, ko ka te māha ki te hapu, nō te taipautini o te waipaunamu a hau, ko Joe Baxter tuku ingoa. Well, kia ora Bridget and thank you very much for your mahi to me today um, and also want to acknowledge the school here and thank you for inviting me to speak. Uh, as Bridget introduced me, um, I have a, a fairly lengthy history in Māori health that goes back to, uh, I suppose, medical school in the 1980s in Auckland. I trained in psychiatry and had a wonderful opportunity to work with the developing Māori mental health services in Tokunui here in uh, Wellington and then in Dunedin. But I had an itch I wanted to scratch, which was if I'm really committed and passionate about Māori health, um, I can do as much as I can in terms of working with patients and whānau and organisations, but I really wanted to understand what was driving the health issues that we were seeing as uh, Māori and experiencing, and particularly in mental health, I was aware that the picture that was happening for Māori and mental health was looking quite disturbing, both in terms of um, the amount of mental health need, but also that we weren't meeting that need. And I, so I changed uh, training and I retrained as a public health medicine physician and was really fortunate to come here, work with Bridget and with Paparangi and the Iru Pomari Centre for a year, and then also worked for the Health Funding Authority uh, looking at how we could achieve health gain for Māori using policy and um, trying to support better health outcomes for Māori. I eventually ended up back in Dunedin at the University of Otago and have had a number of roles. One of my roles is to support the Division of Health Sciences, which oversees all of the health professional programs in terms of its strategic direction in supporting Māori development. And so we've taken quite an aspirational view of that and we hope that we have a division that is able to uh, make a difference for Māori health through its teaching, its research and all of the things it does. So Māori health workforce development and growing the numbers of Māori students, but also supporting those students to thrive and to go out into the world and make a real difference is one of those strategies. And that's the one I wanna talk about today knowing also that the responsibility for Māori health is not Māori alone. And so uh, Bridget, Suze, Pei, Tama and Christchurch and uh, across all of the schools, there's a lot of work going to 
look at our curriculum, what we're teaching our health professional students so that they come out feeling um, fully competent to be able to go out and make a difference for Māori health in whatever field they're on. I'm not talking about that today. I'm just going to really focus on Māori health workforce development. Uh, I want to acknowledge right up the back there, Karen Kōpū from the Ministry of Health, who has been uh, with us from day one, and um, just really want to acknowledge Karen. Um, the support of the Ministry of Health has been uh, really crucial to what we're doing. So I just want to really quickly talk about Māori health need. I know that no one in this room uh, needs an update on equity and the importance in the current status of inequity, but I want to frame this about what we're trying to achieve with regards to workforce alongside a right to have a workforce that reflects and represents our population and our need. We also need a workforce that's going to support making a difference in terms of the health needs that we have. I want to talk a bit about the health workforce and, and where we're currently at, and then go into detail a little bit more about health workforce development at Otago, and particularly our vision for the future. And I wanted to um, also, um, I suppose, highlight some of the outcomes that we've been getting along the way and have got some photos here. And in this photo, um, it's a really good example of some of the outcomes we've already been getting uh, because we happen to have more Māori students and more diversity among our Māori students. So for the first time this year, the Teddy Bear Hospital, which the uh, Medical Students Association runs to bring kids in, to bring their teddies and they treat them and it's this um, fostering and understanding and engagement from children with, with, um, with medical students um, is a really positive thing. So for the first time this year, we had te reo, a Te Reo Māori run um, Teddy Bear Hospital and um, entirely run by medical students. So we now have sufficient Te Reo Māori speaking medical students that we can run our own Teddy Bear Hospital in Te Reo Māori. Uh, so it's just a, a small example of um, some of the, the small and bigger outcomes that we're seeing just by growing our numbers and supporting those students to actually be making a difference. So the, um, you know, there's all sorts of health statistics that I suppose I, f I see as really important in driving this. And one of them in particular, I think, is premature mor morbidity and mortality. And this graph just really highlights that we still have a whole lot of Māori who are dying early through um, conditions that are preventable. And, um, and so again, as we start to think about the health workforce, um, some of the a lot of a lot of the um, challenges that we have in terms of what do we need to do as a health workforce to make a difference um, is high, is about how well are we understanding and meeting the needs of 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 Māori, and so shifting the workforce allows us to see if we can make a difference for some of these important areas. And, and these are also um, health issues that are continue to change and are changing in front of our eyes. And the um, youth suicide inequalities for me have been incredibly disturbing as we continue to watch um, a market inequality in youth suicide. And yet we as health services um, and all sorts of things are still struggling to meet these needs. So where does health workforce sit in a policy framework? And if we go back to He Korowai Oranga, sitting right in the middle of the policy framework is Māori participation in the health and disability sector. So it's been sitting there as one of our key strategies for making a difference for Māori health. And often when we start to talk about what are we doing for Māori health, we will start to look at all of these health issues and we will have a range of initiatives but somehow or rather, the health workforce um, importance in making a difference for Māori health doesn't necessarily end up being embedded in that strategy. It is in the original He Korowai Oranga, but I, I suppose I want to make a case for actually we need to make sure that health workforce is sitting right in the centre of strategies to address Māori health. So our current picture, we know this about the um, population for Māori, 
And yet this is what our health workforce looks like, despite a whole lot of efforts and um, approaches over the years, Māori still, and it's changed slightly, but the last document coming out of the Medical Council was that 3.3% of the current medical workforce is Māori. And for a lot of our um, other registered health workforces, it's sitting between 2 and 5%. And for nursing, it's a little bit better, but not much better sitting in that 7 to 8%. So we, we think about our health equity outcomes and we think about um, what does equity look like in terms of health outcomes. But what does inequity look like in terms of health workforce? And it's pretty marked. So if we were to take the current, based on 200, 2015 health workforce Figures. We see, based on the current nursing um, numbers, we've got 53,000 total nurses. We have about 3,000 Māori nurses, 6.5%. So if we were to have a workforce that represented just Māori in the population, and I'm taking 20% because I think that's also takes into account a little bit of acknowledgement of need, we would have to, I'd have to get my magic wand out now and conjure up 13,000 Māori nurses. I would have to conjure up 2,500 Māori doctors, 380 Māori dentists, and another 320 Māori midwives, and I haven't gone through all of them. So if you can sort of think um, the important role that Māori have in the workforce, and we have been missing out on this because we have had such an inequitable workforce composition, then what has been the impact of not having Māori there on what we've been able to do, what we've been able to achieve, our choice of strategies, what we prioritise. And so um, this huge gap in workforce, uh, I suppose I, I want to, again, why I'm sort of quite passionate in bringing this right front and centre as an area of inequity that we should be striving to address and striving to address as quickly and as fully as we can. Because not only is this a, a something that is unfair in its own right, but it's likely to be contributing to why we have inequitable outcomes across our health sector, because we've not got a, a full representation and a full input from Māori within the health sector. So the drivers to this inequity, actually some of them, uh, and many of them, are sitting in the education space. And if I think about the health professions that we have at Otago, um, the drivers for this are barriers to education. And if we look at structural barriers, we know the same issues which drive inequities in health outcomes drive inequities in education outcomes as well. So the socioeconomic position, um, the impact on education access, affordability, entry, um, access to the kinds of subjects that you need in order to, try to take, in order to be able to enter the health professional programs, massive structural inequities within our education system. So, and then we have institutional barriers. Um, and so uh, if we look at what's happening within schools and the level of UE attainment, you can't come to a university and do a health professional program unless you've got university entrance. And our attainment rates of UE remain um, appalling uh, with regards to in inequalities in, in, in educational outcome. And then if we add science preparation and attainment on top of that, it starts to look pretty grim. So when I did some modelling work in 2010 and looked at who are Māori students coming out of the education sector who have attained three sciences with four credit, 14 credits or more in all of those sciences. So this is the, the, the ideal preparation for um, health sciences first year. There were 210 Māori students in the whole country who had that. And so we knew if we were going to grow our numbers of Māori 
in the health professional programs and the ones that require a strong science base in order to get in there, then one, we needed to be doing stuff in the secondary schools, but two, we needed to be making up for a massive gap um, that wasn't there. So um, the programs that we run, many of them are aimed at seeing if we can accelerate making up for some of the gaps that exist. Um, and then obviously the whole institutional, tertiary institution accessibility and responsiveness. And again, um, our among our current students, when we do surveys of them, about half are first in their family. Many of them are first in their extended family to come to tertiary education. So there's a whole lot of understanding about tertiary education. I know uh, I have a daughter who's in medical school and I realise that her preparation for going to medical school, what's it like, what are the people like, what do I need to do, was just so different from mine. Um, and, um, and so many of the students that we have probably reflect my, my background rather than my daughter's background. Um, and a, a huge barrier to um, sometimes succeeding in that first year at university. So this is slightly old data, but it doesn't look much better now. This is kind of that university entrance and sitting um, roughly at about 20 to 22, 25% of Māori students gaining university entrance. Um, but of those, only about 10% have any science subjects whatsoever. So some of the, um, the work that's done has been to think about, well, why do we want diversity? Like, why, why do we care about this? Shouldn't everyone be considered to be able to meet Māori needs? And I think there's been some really good work coming out of the States and the UK, which has tried to say if we increase health professional diversity, then that will make a difference for health disparity and health equity outcomes. And they have a range of reasons in this model, including um, communication, um, helping services to understand communities, uh, greater trust in the health sector, and greater advocacy. And this stuff is all makes so much sense. It's certainly been um, consistent with my experience of the role that small numbers of Māori have had in the various um, organisations and paths that they play. And this one I just wanted to add, which is what we've been seeing very powerfully as our numbers of Māori students have grown, is the opportunity for colleagues, teams, organisations, um, just in terms of having relationships. And we've, an example for me was last week, we had a whole week uh, of Hawara Māori with our second year medical students. And we have 65 Māori students in that class now. Um, and the things that they did and what they came up with and their level of engagement with things Māori was, was fairly astounding. We had fairly radical, activistic slam poetry coming back at us by the end of the week. Um, and I, I believe really strongly that the presence of Māori students in that class has empowered their colleagues to come on board with things Māori. And so this is what we've been missing out on in the health sector by just not having Māori there. Um, and so this is, this is a positive, a real positive. This isn't, uh, so a lot of the focus is we will have more people who will go and work in a particular place to make a difference. We will have more people who will have that direct capacity to work with individuals, whānaus and communities. But very powerfully, we're seeing with the students, we will have people who will be taking other people with them as colleagues, as organisations. And we, we've missed out on that. So would we have the level of uncertainty in health services with regards to how to work with and meet Māori needs or the level of marginalisation of Māori services if Māori had been front and centre and participating across the health sector at all levels in the first place. So the impacts of the gross underrepresentation of Māori health in the health workforce include impacts on where health professionals may choose to work, the levels of health sector participation. There's been fewer Māori to take on expertise and representation roles, and there's been considerable burnout on the small numbers that have. We've got marginalisation or invisibility in leadership spaces and decision-making and resource discussions. 
Um, our colleagues and the teams are missing out on um, having that diversity influence of Māori in that space. And of course, there's the standard things about patient concordance and role modelling for Māori youth. So at the Teddy Bear Hospital, um, one of the main outcomes was that those kids coming out of the kōhanga and the kōra could see Māori, could see Māori doctors, Māori dental students as normal and ordinary. Um, and that hasn't been the case. So it's amazing to see that our kids are being exposed to Māori as health professionals in a way that we've never seen before. So this is kind of some of the where people choose to work issue. So if we look at one of the most wealthy DHB areas in the country, we have 105 um, GPs per 100,000 population. Counties Manukau, we have 65. If we look at dental distribution and someone's done a piece of research, we see something like this. So how much the inverse care law is driven by the fact that the people that we have represented as health professionals don't represent the breadth and depth of the communities we come from is something I think we need to ask ourselves. And what is the downstream impact of that on the kinds of services that communities that may be largely Māori or Pacific have, I think is also another really important question. So other roles that Māori have, we talked about the influence and impact on the health sector and the isolation and expectation. And this came from a um, piece of research from a doctor who said, I'm usually the only Māori on the team. I'm always the only Māori doctor. Everyone expects so much, but I'm still training. This is not an unusual comment coming back from um, Māori within the health workforce. And when we've done pieces of work with other health professional groups, this is the kind of statements that we've had. So what is the impact of being alone and isolated? And then this is a tricky one, but this is about skin in the game. And so, um, and I always think of Papurangi with this, um, you know, in a plate of bacon and eggs, um, the chicken was involved, but the pig was committed. And there is something about um, being Māori, which means that you're committed to Māori health. And other people can have a real interest in it. They can really acknowledge it. Um, but there's that added extra vim that comes from that level of commitment. And we have missed out on those people in the health sector for a long time. So research that we've done, and we've had a couple of pieces of research, both done by BMed Sci students. Um, I want to acknowledge them both. One was a survey of Māori medical graduates from Otago, and the other one was a, um, had included qualitative interviews with Māori doctors. And there were a myriad of roles and um, things that people were doing to make a difference for Māori health. And I won't go into those, but it was really reaffirming I think of what we thought we knew anecdotally was that, and this is just among doctors, but it's probably true for others, that Māori health professionals are out there making a difference for Māori health and disproportionately having roles engaging with Māori health. So the benefits of a strong Māori workforce include Māori participation in all parts of the health sector, increased capacity for Māori-led health provision, increased access to culturally responsive services, Māori workforce in all areas, including areas of high importance, rather than having really huge gaps, um, that area of influence, advocacy, problem solving, and impact on cultural competence and structural competence um, and cultural safety of the organisations and um, services that they work in. So just really quickly, I'm going to talk to you about what we've been doing in Otago. Um, we were aware in 2000 and coming up to 2010 that things were pretty dismal in terms of overall Māori outcomes going through to and through health professional programs. And in the competitive health science first year, less than half of Māori students who were entering health science first year were making it into second semester, having passed all first semester papers. Um, so losing a lot of students and the downstream impact was that we were getting small numbers into health professional programs. So in, um, this is a kind of what the world looks like a bit now, but um, just as a, a brief, we have 
a whole lot of health professional degrees. We have eight undergraduate degrees and one postgraduate degree. We've got a range of other programs. So as a division, we also oversee this, the students, Māori students who are doing BSCs in biomedical sciences and the students now undertaking the new Bachelor of Health Science where we now have a Māori health major. So that equates to about 800 Māori students we now currently have under our watch, but it wasn't always that many. So we set up the Māori Health Workforce Development Unit and, and this was um, strongly supported by the Ministry of Health and our goal was that by 2020 that at least 20% of students across the Division of Health Sciences were Māori. The starting point was about 5% um, and we have a range of approaches to doing that. Over about a three year period we set up a, a number of programs starting with um, outreach programs, foundation studies, uh, comprehensive support for health science first year students and then um, support for students in degree programs. And our philosophy was really this from inspiration to graduation. And what we were aware of is that people sometimes will have a focus on one part of that pipeline, but um, drop the ball. So we thought we've got to be in it for the, the long haul from secondary school right through to graduation and now doing work to look at what do we do after graduation. And these are these four programs. So I'm just going to talk about very briefly some of these programs. Tu Kahika is a foundation scholarships program and takes up to about uh, between 15 and 19 Māori school leavers from around the country who have experienced educational disadvantage so that they haven't had access to the sort of secondary schooling that will help them to succeed in health science first year. So they are um, funded on a scholarship, they have their accommodation supported, their fees are paid and we have a staff member who fully supports those. These, um, about half the students don't have UE when they start the program and um, this is really at the, the cutting edge of our, our internal equity, students coming from, often from low decile schools. Um, and these are the students who would probably not otherwise be in tertiary education without this. Our Health Sci First Year program we've been working on, we've got a whole range of research running around this program, but we do a number of things supporting the students as a full cohort, we have group support and individual support. And a lot of what we do here is to wrap around using Māori values, a very Māori centred approach for knowing a tanga, working on relationships with each other and the other parts of the, um, and, and with us and with tutors, we provide academic support. We have all weekend physics and chemistry, Wānanga and uh, the first few years we did it, we, we did it accidentally, but we had the physics chutes on the same weekend as the Hyde Street party and they came to the physics chutes, so that was good. Um, and we have huge um, participation by the students. We run a, a program called SWOT, where students who've previously done really well in health science first year have a group of about 12 new health science first year Māori students and they help support them to make sense of what it means to come to the university, those kinds of things. We individually interview all the students and we look at their learning styles and we do a range of things um, to support them. And then our final program is Tu Tawira Hawara, which is the support provided for students once they're in various programs, but as well as the health science degree programs. And um, again, using a very similar approach, we do tend to let go a little bit at this stage because partly we don't have the resources to provide the level of comprehensive support that we do in the earlier years, but also they've already got amazing support going on between each other and what we recognise is that students are each other's biggest support. So some of our outcomes the, um, from Tukaika, uh, as well as the quantitative outcomes we've had, these are the kind of qualitative outcomes in this quote, the feeling that you're part of something bigger than yourself and important is priceless. The support is amazing and everybody is made to feel that they matter in terms of the bigger picture. Now, some like 80% of these students go on to do health science first year and many go on to gain places in health professional programs. So we've now started to get the graduates for, from these programs and this is just a few of those um, we've got. They're everywhere um, in all programs. 
and um, out in DHBs and communities doing all sorts of amazing things. An incredible group of young people. We've had our 150th Tukahika student come through this year. So um, this is a little bit old, but we now have about 350 Māori students studying across all of our health professional programs. And this just shows where the different programs were um, implemented. Um, and this is what's happened with medical program. We have 248 Māori medical students currently across all years of our program. Um, and this is what's happened in terms of health science first year. So this is what's killing us, is um, we haven't gone out and done hard out recruiting but the numbers of Māori students coming into health science first year has grown hugely. Um, and so, and, and this is a hugely positive thing. Um, so some of our increase in numbers is being driven by, certainly being driven by much, much better ac academic outcomes in health science first year. So the, the numbers in health professional programs has not occurred because we've changed any kind of entry bar it's purely because those students in health sciences are doing better. So they're meeting the bars that already existed in 2006, 7, 8. Um, and now we're getting more students coming our way. Um, and these are really diverse students. They still reflect that full diversity. Many of them has massive gaps in sciences, no physics, no chemistry. Um, and we're just working in that space, trying to figure out how we make up for those gaps, as well as trying to influence down into the secondary school sector. So we've done research around the critical success factors, and really it's about, been about putting the students and whānau at the centre, having Māori-led and directed programmes, enabling policy and leadership, amazing commitment. I want to acknowledge uh, Peter Crampton as the PVC, who's just stepped down from being the PVC. But the mirror on society policy that he brought in was hugely enabling and empowering of our programs, the Pacific programs and other programs. And then just a whole lot of stuff feeding into this. So our impact, and you'll recognise some of these people, sorry Jordan, um, but it just it's like a, a garden where we've planted some seeds and those seeds are now growing and they're dropping their seeds everywhere and we've got stuff happening everywhere. Um, and really, um, really wonderful to see. And this is just early days. And uh, these were the 46 Māori graduates from 2016. And someone asked, where did they go? And so this is just where they went. The only area where there was a huge gap was the southern area. So I've got to work on my own back door. But um, they went everywhere. So... I suppose what I wanted to do was to really reinforce that these are really key pathways, um, you know, community development, tackling and fostering um, Māori models of health, removing barriers and then effective health and disability services. But if we can get it right as well with our Māori participation, then that will feed into a lot more, it will accelerate the other two. And so, I, I kind of, you know, as a public health physician, I'm very, very clear about what's happening with our determinants and the, the roles that bigger picture stuff happen in, in health and our need to tackle health services. But I want to stick health workforce in this, in this blender um, because if we leave it out and we keep saying, wouldn't it be great if we could do this, but we just don't have the money capacity. You know, next time someone says it's, you know, we could do more if we had more money capacity. I've, I may not be responsible for my actions. So the vision is for us, and this is um, taking our divisional vision, is what if 20% of the health workforce was Māori? And they were everywhere, we were everywhere. And we were realising all the benefits of a strong Māori health workforce, the thriving Māori-led services, reflection of tēnā oranga teratanga. All our health practitioners were culturally competent, we had culturally safe services. And that we were achieving equity of outcome, not just in health, but also in education. And so, yeah, just finally, um, we have this massive health need. We have a gross inequity in the health workforce. Education is a driver and a contributor. Um, and we have a whole lot of opportunities if we can um, make this a priority and just get on with it. Anyway, kia ora. <laughs> Thank you.
thanks so much, Joe. Um, not only for your great talk, but also for your sterling work um, and growing our Māori health workforce. We've got uh, about, oh, we've got about 10 minutes for questions um, from the floor. And can you please uh, use a mic because people are listening online. And we've got 25 people online, so um, hopefully some of those will have a question as well. Not a die. I've just first of all, I want to just acknowledge your incredible work in this area and your um, leadership and vision. Uh, you know, really, it's really been completely game changing, and just wanted to acknowledge that and you and your team, but you. Um, but also, just wanted to know um, what's going on in the school systems in terms of meeting that science gap that you. Um, not. Tried. Not a lot. Um, We've got real challenges in Māori outcomes and education across the board, and it's almost like the science gap, you know, it's sort of like a, a pyramid where in order to achieve that, you have to get to NCA level three and you have to have done it. So we've got the science gap, but it sits on top of a, an, an, an achievement gap to actually get to there to be able to do sciences. So um, there's things, hopefully being addressed within that. So we, we've, we, we work with individual schools, we've worked with the Farikura, um, a number of Farikura who have been trying to figure out how do we get a science curriculum when it doesn't fit with our kaupapa or what we resource to do. So um, people have come up with solutions like um, bringing in tutors and doing correspondence on the side of all of their other stuff, going to schools where they do teach these things, um, we go to secondary school teachers conferences, we've been working a little bit with um, secondary school principals, but there's a long ways to go to join the dogs. And the intersectoral, the intersectoral aspect of this needs to come together. There isn't a lot of linking between um, what w this issue and say the, the education sector. So it feels like there's a long way to go and we're we're picking away at the pieces but we're not i don't think we we've not got a whole transformational strategic thing happening in that space as yet but hopefully it, i mean it's a small thing really but the the numbers of health yeah. professionals you know providing role models and therefore yeah. feeding back in and um you know you would hope that that would have an impact although that yeah. might take a while to come through but well, that certainly is the case where we have quite a lot of the students. I always say, you know, how did you, who inspired you or how did you come here? And now it is these emerging people coming out who, who've said to someone, oh, what are you doing at school? And then the next minute, and we actually have a couple of our doctors who are actively got groups of secondary school students in their areas who they are, they are mentoring and supporting. So it's, it's starting to happen but actually the racism in schools is a big problem. So when I say to students, why didn't you take physics in school? I was told I wasn't bright enough. Go to see the guidance counselor, um, here's your pathway. So, so some of it can be positioned back to, is this a marketing issue to help Maori have aspirations and if they've got those aspirations they'll take the right pathway or do we have an education sector that's still actively actually not doing it and I'm not saying the whole education sector but um, it's still we've still got a ways to go um, in that space as well Can you just introduce yourself? Kia ora, Joe. I'm Neville. Um, <laughs> Kia ora. Uh, thanks very much. That's really inspiring and really good. Um, can, is this so? Foundation year has been shown in other areas of inequalities to work really, really well for uh, kind of addressing that. Um, education gap, if you like, um, can, are, and it seems to be working really well here. Can we, and is the University of Otago going to build on your success and try 
move that out to not just the health uh, sciences division, but the other divisions and in particular science itself? Uh, so there has been a lot of thinking about how to do this um, and it is very resource intensive. Um, and so some of the challenges with, um, particularly if you're really wanting to change something that needs that degree of change, then you need that degree of resources. So um, we're really fortunate we've had our Ministry of Health funding. We wouldn't be doing this if the Ministry of Health didn't fund it. It's not the university that's, that's providing those resources. So, um, you know, so some of this might be, yes, we want this to happen. How would we resource it? And we certainly have been really open with, gosh, this seems to be working, everyone. <laughs> you know, but um, because of the resourcing, sometimes that's the step that sort of stops it from saying, yay, and we will all do it. So we can do it, and if we want to do it, we just need to resource it. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. We'll have our online question now. It's a question from Jade at Waikato, and she's um, asking about the pathway that you mentioned from inspiration to graduation. Do you have any comments on whether the healthcare system is ready to continue the pathway for workforce development, including support and retention after graduation? Ah, that's a really good question, Jade. Um, I have been... Um, really concerned about this for a number of years and had a couple of attempts at getting an HRC grant to work with DHBs to look at what best practice would look like in the support of Māori health professional students or health professionals as they come out into the workforce because of that very issue. I didn't have much luck with the HRC so I have gone directly to um, the DHBs and in the process of potentially doing a project with initially the South Island DHBs to do exactly that, to sort of figure out what should the DHBs be doing, what should they look like, what support needs to be in place, what are the HR processes, what are the, what is the training, what does cultural competency look like in that space so that Māori um, who work there have a very positive experience and can thrive. So that's in the wings. Um, I've got some ideas about that, but the feedback I get from our graduates who are out there is that there are little pockets where things are going well, but on the whole, they kind of end up having to leave being Māori at the door as part of their roles in the workforce. Uh, Michael? Uh, kia ora jo. Um, congratulations on this wonderful um, framework you've got and also this, the huge success you're achieving. I should say Michael from Public Health. Um, I just wanted, to what extent is this model being adopted by other tertiary institutions? Because obviously Auckland, but also many universities are providing nursing graduates. Um, is Otago really leading the way at the moment? Uh, no, I think we're, um, what's interesting is that we've each, so Auckland's doing some amazing things um, with Elena and Paparangi and their team. And so they've got some similar but slightly differently adapted programs um, around their context. Um, and then we've got some different approaches happening, for instance, um, institutions setting up Māori specific nursing programs. And we have um, Fitirea doing um, very, um, you know, sort of trying to um, have pathways in particular for Māori and Pacific students in nursing. So there's a range of things and we, um, we do kind of share what we're doing and we have informal um, connections and relationships. Uh, but I think it's happening in pockets. And I think um, it, like a lot of the outcomes we're getting may very well be because some of the students that we have have happened to have been through pathways that have come out of, um, you know, people that have benefited from other people's secondary school stuff. So we, we kind of join the dots a little bit, but it could do with a a more comprehensive, um, it's in pockets and not comprehensive. Last, any last questions? Uh, in the middle. 
Kia ora, Joan, and congratulations on your work. I'm Gordon Mackay from Capital Coast DHB. I'm an HR manager within Surgery Women's and Children's area. Um, I'm really keen to know if, as a DHB, we were to focus in on one aspect of making a difference for the Maori health workforce, what that would look like for you? Um, I think so. I've been doing a bit of work as part of a build up to the project. And I think, um, I don't, I think the tricky thing is that people are looking for one thing and the one thing doesn't usually cut the mustard. So um, my, when, we, when we got comprehensive, things started working. When we did isolated one-off, we'll have one of these and two of those, and we might do this three times a year, and we'll, that, will, that doesn't work. Um, so the sorts of things I would be thinking of would be that you have someone who has a role in the pastoral and for knowing a tanga and, and coordinating and doing stuff, that you have a policy that says we really value this, we want to grow our Māori staff, that you have policies that say when they need to do something for professional development as Māori, that their team doesn't say, sorry, you're employed as a Māori, and, as a doctor and not as a Māori, that sort of thing. Um, you know, so there's a, a comprehensive top-down policy with a range of initiatives and someone whose role it is to make it happen. One of the biggest barriers I see to things not happening is that people have ideas about what they want to do, but no one's got a role to make it happen. And, that, and, and I think they imagine that there's some fairy out there that flies around and, and makes stuff happen, but, uh, you know, there is no fairy. Yeah. That's right. Sorry. <laughs> Joe's got a really hard-working team to <laughs> making things happen. Yeah. Uh, so thank you very much, Joe. Um, that's been really exciting um, to see the work and, and to hear that you're working, moving into the uh, postgraduate and, and health professional space. Oh. So thanks. thanks, thanks. thanks.